Okay, everybody, welcome. We are here on lecture 26. We are continuing our conversation on magnetic resonance imaging. So uh, you've had a reading and we can talk about the mapping of the body. In the last lecture, chapter 25, uh, lecture 25, we were talking about how contrast is obtained. I showed you all those pictures about um, how some tissues are light and some tissues are dark. Uh, depending on whether you use T1 or T2 weighting, and how the different tissues could then be resolved. But now we have to get into the really difficult question of how are you going to locate those tissues within the body? What about the spatial resolution? So it's fine that fat and water and all those things with T1 and T2 times have different magnetic properties, but how is that going to help us find where in the body that thing is and make a three-dimensional map? Um, and what we're specifically trying to do now is going to be breaking the body up into different planes. And how are we going to do that? And quite simply, the answer is going to be field gradients. All right, that's going to be the whole point. Uh, so let's take a look at some of these uh, questions. As always, I hope you've done the reading. If you haven't, pause the video here go back do the reading first it's going to make this video make a lot more sense without me there in person it's very hard just to listen to me talk to try to understand these things you're supposed to be getting all the understanding from your reading and then these lecture notes are going to expand upon those things and really help you deepen your understanding okay so let's just take a look at what this uh, looks like so maybe I'll do this I'll make this a little bigger here so we're on lecture 26. Let's go. All right, so here's our first question. So how does the MRI know which axial slice of the person the emitted RF radiation is coming from? Only one of these is going to be correct. I do this because I have this beautiful animation here right, of what the MRI looks like as we go through different slices. So one of the things you need to understand is what these different planes are. So these are axial planes or axial slices of the head coming through. Axial is cutting across this way. Coronal, ha, huh, that's kind of a funny word nowadays, isn't it? Not the corona plane, but coronal plane cuts through the body this way. And then sagittal will be cutting through the plane this way. This is These are three words, axial, sagittal, and coronal. You really do need to understand those to know anything about imaging. Okay. So how do you know which axial slice of the patient is coming from when you look at this picture? All right. I want to pause it maybe. And how do I know it's actually that slice that it's coming from? So do what we did before. Pause the video. Take a look at these answers. Write your answer down. And when you're ready, to see what the answer is, then go ahead, unpause the video. Uh, I will pause and stop talking right now. Okay, welcome back. So what did you think that was? Only one of these is correct. Yeah, it's number four. This is the figure from Kane that you should have been remembering. The RF excitation pulse can only excite a single narrow slice due to the smoothly varying changes in the magnetic field strength. So this is going to be a key idea from today's lecture. How do you know it's coming from just this slice? This is called magnetic field gradients. Smoothly varying changes in the magnetic field strength, meaning the field is not uniform, we're going to superimpose changes on top of it, are going to allow us to identify locations in the body. So which one of these factors determines the thickness of an MRI slice. So you take a look at this picture here, right? This little gray shaded region is, say, the thickness of this slice. So only this slice is excited at a certain frequency due to your gradients. But how thick is that slice? A millimeter, a centimeter, five centimeters? What determines that? One of these has got to be correct. What do you think it is? So do what we do. Pause the video. Read these five answers. Write down your answer, and when you think you know what it is, resume the video and find out if you're right or not. I'll pause now. All right, so welcome back. Do you have your answer determined? Let's see what you all thought. It's number one. The magnitude of the magnetic field gradient is going to be doing these things. OK. So let's see how that all uh, works out. So 
Sorry about that, everybody. I just had to pause for one second. I'm back. So we were talking about how the magnitude of the magnetic field gradient uh, is going to determine the width of that slice. And strictly speaking, of course, this is something we're going to talk about today. Um, if the field is weaker over here and stronger over here, it's the slope of the change in the gradient that determines what range of frequencies is going to be on resonance here. Obviously, if the field is the same everywhere, the whole body, one gigantic slice, is on resonance. And if the field changes extremely rapidly, meaning the gradient or change is high, that will lead to a much narrower slice. That's going to be one of the key ideas. All right, take a look at this. So to generate the depicted B0, which is here, with a Z gradient, which is here, in which direction should the current flow through the gradient coils? So let's go ahead and take a look at that. This is kind of an interactive right-hand rule question. So B0, the main field, magnetic field from the superconducting magnets, is always going in one direction. So in this case, they're showing it's going from the feet down to the head, always right to left in this picture. You're superimposing a change in the field such that that magnetic field always pointing right to left here is a little weaker at their feet, their feet and a little stronger at their head. So you need to throw flow current through these coils to make a field that's superimposed on top of it to make it weaker here and stronger down here. So how are you going to do that? Right hand rule. All you have to do is, for a loop, you curl your fingers in the direction of the current flow. So there's, what, eight red arrows up on that screen. What you need is when you curl your fingers in the direction of the arrow, at the feet it needs to be pointing against their feet, so against the direction of the field, to make it weaker. And on the head end, when you do it, it needs to be pointing in the direction of the field to make it stronger. So which one of those conditions makes that true? Right? So just do a pair on each of those four, always with your fingers in the direction of the red arrow, and then your thumb points in the direction of the field. So on these pages, it's always going to be kind of looking at you like this, and your thumb is pointing out. I'm having a hard time doing it down on the page like that, but position your hand however you need to do. So which one of those has your thumb pointing against the field, which would be to the, to the, towards their feet on the feet end? Your thumb should be pointing to the right. And on the head end, your thumb should be pointing to the left, which is in the direction of the field. Which one of those does that? Pause now and try to figure that out. OK, I'm back. So what did you get for an answer on that? The correct answer is 2, right? On 2, if you can move your hand in the direction of the arrow, then your thumb, always right hand, in the right hand rule, thumb is pointing towards their toes, so that's opposing the magnetic field, field is weaker. Up at the head, note it's going up, curl your hand up, your thumb is pointing in the direction of the main field, that makes it stronger. Magnetic fields will always add, they're vectors, they always add. Right, so the field is always pointing from toes to head, but weaker at the toes. So kind of a difficult idea to understand, but it's really important you start to get in that idea. All right, let's take a look at the next question. All right, so in a typical MRI image, and in this 8 voxel by 8 voxel slice here, so here's a patient, you've got 8 voxels by 8 voxels, a voxel is just a little cube, here's one axial slice, I'm breaking it up into like 64 little boxes, 8 by 8. How many different measurements need to be made to image the slice? Remember, each 90 degree or pi by 2 RF pulse is a new measurement. It's starting the experiment over. How many measurements do you need to do to get an 8 by 8 slice like this? So think about that. Hit pause. And when you think you have an answer, go ahead and resume. I'll wait. Okay, welcome back. Let's see if you are ready for that. Let me see if I can maximize this on full screen because there may be an animation here. There we go. Let's watch what happens here. So each measurement comes from one echo, which reads out one row of the slice. So the answer is eight, right? So the trick about MR is that each measurement is going to get the echo according to these pink lines. A measurement gets the entire row of that slice. And since there are eight rows, you need to do eight measurements. So it's not 64. It's not one measurement per voxel. 
but one measurement per row and we're going to read that out and what we're going to see in today's lecture is there's a couple different gradients this is one of the key ideas the axial gradient will tell you which slice through the body you're taking the phase encode gradient will select which row you're reading out and the frequency encode gradient will actually read out the row so three magnetic field gradients axial phase encode and frequency to make a 3d measurement Please read Kane, top of page 384, where she completely describes this. Let's go back and watch this again. I'm going to call your attention to this up here. This is kind of the sequence of how a measurement is made in MR. Watch it come in one row at a time, another pi by two pulse, one row, another pi by two pulse, another 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 row, like that. So it's sequential for each slice, like that. Okay? Let's move on. All right. So I already said that this is going to be a very important uh, figure to understand for all imaging in 3D, all tomographic images. They use these words. So if you're doing any kind of medical imaging, you just need to know these words and you need to remember what they are. So axial is always cutting transverse crossways through a human body shown on the left or the right. Coronal is cutting through. I always think of coronal because coronal is like crown. So it's like looking at the crown. So it'd be cut through your face this way. And then sagittal would be this way, right? Looking through the side of you. So these are two different representations. This should not be a difficult concept for you to grasp, but you do really need to understand that. Okay. Okay. So now let's get into the meat of the lecture. How do we locate where in the body these MR signals are coming from? One word, gradients. If anyone ever asks you, how is it that MR can tell where in the body things are? The answer is gradients. We will superimpose changes to the magnetic field such that it's stronger on one side, weaker in the other, and that will distinguish our X, Y, and Z planes. It's important to know that the field always points in one direction. So I'm going to go to this IMAOS website. Let's just see if we can open that up now. Okay, there they are, magnetic field gradients. So again, this is that site. Uh, this is the EMRI, spatial encoding, the whole thing. Look at all these wonderful lectures, great lectures online. These are pictures. We're going to go into these. So this is again what the picture looks like note that the magnetic field always pointing in one direction but if you want to break the body up into slices this way then the magnetic fields needs to be different here than here so this is called a gradient that an axial gradient makes it weaker here stronger here we will imply apply for example a phase encode gradient magnetic field again always pointing in these pictures from feet to head but now it's a little weaker down on this end of the on the back side the posterior side of the body and stronger up here on the anterior side of the body so remember arrows always represent the magnetic field line with the direction and the length of the arrow is the strength so obviously it's stronger up here where it's red weaker down here when it's yellow but always pointing in one direction does that make some sense all right, and then the third direction is just this. So we can call this uh, the frequency encode gradient. Now we knew posterior from anterior. How do we know left from right? We'll just impose another gradient, right? So it'll be weaker on the, this side of the patient, stronger on this side of the patient. What did I say? Always pointing from toes up to head, but weaker here, stronger here. This will allow you to locate the signal on the left or the right side of the body. So three dimensions, X, Y, Z, three gradients, one, two, three. All right, so try reading about that. Let's just go through some of these animations. Well, this is a neat thing. Uh, let's just take a look at this. This is why I really think you should go to this website and work through these things. Here's a uh, MRI sequence of the spin echo type. Oh, spin echo, you guys know about that. We learned about spin echo last time. So let's just watch how this comes. This is an animated pulse sequence. This is what you've got to understand out of today's lecture, all right? This is how an MR measurement is done. These are repeated spin echo pulse sequences. Let's just pause it there. All right. This is, I need you to know what this is by the end of this chapter on MR. This is the typical representation of a pulse sequence. It's got one, two, three, four, five lines. It's got one line. 
that you learned in the last lecture, which is what radio frequency pulses are you putting in? You put in a pi by 2 pulse, that starts the experiment always. Pi by 2, pi by 2. Usually it should be labeled 90 degrees or pi by 2. It's not here, but you should do that. This pulse here, oh, I know what that is. That has to be the pi pulse, right? The pi pulse comes at time TE over 2. Draw down, look, right? So it's TE over 2 from pi by 2 to pi, another TE over 2 to the echo, and there's the echo, and that defines TE, the echo time, and you know that. You know what the echo time is. And then, of course, what we learned in the last lecture is after your experiment's completely done, you wait a time TR, the repetition time, you hit it with another uh, pi by 2 90 degree pulse, and you start the experiment all over again. And as we saw earlier, this will be on a different row in the axial slice. So last lecture, you saw this RF, and you saw the signal. This is that echo coming in. You have to draw that. The things that you have to include now are these three lines. One, two, three. These will tell you what the gradients are. Slice selection gradient. Phase encode gradient. Frequency encode gradient. All right. These are, so usually a pulse sequence will have five lines. RF, you beam in. Signal coming out of the patient and the three gradients you're applying to make that happen. And I'm going to go through the rules of what these symbols are in the lecture. Okay, let's just go next. Let's see what comes next here. All right, so selecting the slice plane, selective excitation. So this is the what's called the slice selection gradient. All right, so the idea of the slice selection gradient is it starts the pulse right away. Uh, it's going to be occurring up here. So the point is, when we beam in that RF wave, the 90 degree pi by 2 pulse, you do not want all the spins in the body to respond. In the last two lectures we've seen, the magnetic field makes the spins precess, but when you apply the pi by 2 pulse, the spins flip to the XY plane. Well, if you don't use a gradient, all the spins in the body flip and then you're just getting signal from the whole body. We only want the spins in a narrow plane of the patient to respond. So we apply the gradient such that only one of the slices is on resonance. So let's take a look here. So here's our main field, B0. Here's our gradient right here. And so it just means that each slice of the patient is feeling a slightly different magnetic field, which means when you apply the RF, only one of those slices is on resonance with the patient. All right. So see this? In this case, it only excited that center, that center slice. All right. Ordinarily, without the gradient, all those slices would be on resonance. But in this case, uh, only the one slice will be on resonance. So I hope that makes some kind of sense for you. Uh, let's go back. Let's go back to this. Um, all right. So how is it that only one slice is on resonance? Well, you have to remember that the change in energies between spin up and spin down depends on the magnetic field. So if you say what is the change of those en energies. All right, the simple equation that you saw looked something like this. So the change in energies between spin up and spin down was this gamma, which is the gyromagnetic ratio, B, which is the intensity of the magnetic field, and H bar, which is just a constant. So the point is now each slice through your body is seeing a different B field. All right, so if each slice is seeing a different B field, when you apply an RF frequency pulse, which has just one specific frequency, it's only one slice that that's on resonance with. Because remember, this delta E is also equal to uh, HF, which is equal to H bar omega of the photon. So let me just write this out. So it looks something like that, right? So you're beaming in an energy of a photon that has a certain energy. It's only got one energy because that's the wave you're beaming in. 
When that energy matches this condition, then it's on resonance and the spin flips. But if all the planes are seeing a different B field, there's only one plane that's on that resonance, and there's only one plane that's going to respond. And that's the idea of the axial slice. All right, let's see if we can take a look at some different pictures on that in this lecture. So this is called SSG, slice selection gradient. The slice is usually cutting the patient axially this way. Here's the patient lying. We're going to do that by applying a gradient from toe to head, which means it's weaker on one end by the toes, stronger on one end by the head. We will do this by applying gradient coils. And then the coil is going to superimpose uh, a magnetic field change onto the patient. It's going to be nominally without the gradient. It's about B naught. And that means that the frequency of the photon on resonance with B naught is omega naught. But as you increase the field on one end and decrease the field on the other end, then the frequencies that are on resonance with that field change. And so the actual magnetic field that the patient sees is this yellow line, like this, which means that when you come in at any given frequency of photon that you choose, you go across, that's the only place in the patient that's on resonance, and all the spins in that plane get excited. Obviously, then we want to do when we want to do a full measurement, say of your head, you need to do this many, 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 many times to get different slices. So you cannot acquire all the slices at once. You do them sequentially. All right. Uh, here's a lovely figure that I have uh, that I found probably at the Simeo site. If you notice, uh, no, not that site. It was a different site. But if you actually look at these, you'll see that they actually have the current direction drawn wrong. Uh, for the magnetic field gradient they're trying to superpose, which actually makes me laugh because anyone who's been in a medical physics class should know immediately that those questions are not right. All right. So this is the idea of the slice selection gradient. Um, I hope that makes some kind of sense for you. Okay. All right, so what do we do if we want to resolve a voxel in three dimensions? So it seemed like we need to do it three times. So I'm going to go to full screen on this so we have an animation. So if you just go through these slides and try to understand each step, you'll be in good shape. I think there's what? There's going to be nine steps in an MR sequence, and then we're just going to repeat that many, many, many times. All right, but see if you can go through and understand uh, how that's going to work. All right, so we're going to come back to this in a second. Let's take a look at these other gradients, phase encode gradient and frequency encode gradient, all right, if we can. So I'll come back to this. So we're trying to work our way through this IMAO uh, site, 2D spatial encode gradients. Oh, it's not responding. Let's see if we can recover the website. You're probably going to have the exact same problems uh, that I'm having. Okay, here it comes. So we did the selective excitation of the axial slice. Let's try our phase encode gradient. Okay, so here is going to be the second gradient, phase encode gradient. Um, so say you're applying this along X. All right, so this is going to be this symbol here. So basically the slice uh, axial slice selection gradient, just these gray boxes, when the gradient is on, it's a little box and it's gray. When the gradient is off, it's just the flat line. So here's the phase encode gradient. Now I want to pick out a certain row of the patient. So to do the second gradient, we are going to change the precession frequencies in a very smooth way. So now we're only talking within one slice. All right. So you've done your slice selection gradient. You've tipped over the protons just in one slice. Say it's just that, let's just pretend we're at the level of my glasses now for the rest of this conversation. But that's the only slice I'm talking to. So the rest of the protons are not even beaming out information. I know I'm in that slice. How do I tell front to back? How do I tell side to side? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is apply a phase encode gradient, which means I'm going to make the spins from one side to the other be out of phase uh, with each other by getting some moving faster and some moving slower, and then I'll turn it off. When I'm done, they'll all be spinning at the same speed, but they're going to be slightly out of phase with each other, which means that my MR unit is going to know right from left due to that phase relationship. So let's see if we can watch what this thing is doing. Okay, so look at that. 
All right. So they started off, they were all spinning. They're all spinning at the same frequency. When I apply the phase encode gradient, because the Lamar precession frequency depends on the magnetic field, when they feel a different field, they spin at a different rate, and then you turn it off, and now they're out of phase, right? So this things, these are all in phase with each other. These are in phase with each other. These are in phase with each other, but they're out of phase with each other, which means that in the MR unit, this row is different than this row is different than that row. And then you turn it off. So the phase encode gradient is the application of this red business here. It's a little ladder. And then it does something like that. All right. So look, you start off here. Here's what's going to happen. They're all rotating. That's the Lamar precession frequency in phase. You're going to apply a gradient from bottom to top, meaning these guys see a different field than these guys. They will spin at a different rate. The precession frequency changes. And then you turn it off and they get out of phase. So there's the gradient. All right. Stronger here, weaker here. These guys are spinning different than these guys. You just let it go for a little while to get them into a different phase relationship. You turn it off, and then you do your experiment. So that's occurring right here. When that gradient's on, that's this business. You're moving from left to right. In a pulse sequence, this is what? Radio frequency you beam in. Signal you get out. This will be slice selection gradient. Phase encode gradient frequency encode gradient, and it's always time moving from left to right. All right. And so here's another animation here where uh, once you do an image, right, uh, you can get different phases. And then the key is we're going to have to just do that many, many, many times to resolve the different rows in the body. So an actual MR measurement is it's not enough just to do this once. You're going to do it a bunch of times over and over and over, sometimes with a weak gradient, then stronger, then stronger yet, and etc. Usually the way we do it is we go very, very strong in one direction, and then weaker, weaker, weaker until there's no gradient, and then we just get stronger in the other direction. And so it might look something like this. All right, you've got some very strong signals, some very weak signals. All right, so that wasn't so absolutely useful. Um, but that's how the phase encode gradient works. So let's go back to our animation and see if that makes some kind of sense. So these signals, time, always moving from left to right. I'm going to explain to you what's happening with the number, and the blue line will show where you are in time. If you can understand these nine steps, you've really got it. All right, so step one. Apply the slice selection gradient in Z. So here's our blue line. That's where we are. The slice selection gradient comes on. That's this gray line. That's when you apply the pi by 2 pulse, right? It starts the experiment, but you only want the experiment in one slice of the patient. So the slice selection gradient must be on when the pi by 2 pulse is on. All right? It has to. That way you only excite that one particular axial slice. Once you've tipped the protons, spins in that axial slice, that part is done, you turn the thing off, you step forward in time. So step two, turn off the slice selection gradient. I put it here, nothing is happening. You have to wait some amount of time. Step three, we just talked about it. Apply the phase encode gradient, say, in the Y direction. So now I know what Z slice I have of the patient, but how do I know posterior to anterior? Well, let's apply a phase encode gradient, in this case in the Y direction, with a variable strength that you control. That selects one row in that slice. Okay, we're going to need to do that many, many times. And that's what this symbol actually means. Note how this thing with the little step ladder is different than any other symbol. This is called the ladder symbol. It means that every time you do this, and you're going to do it a bunch of times, you'll do it with a different gradient strength. Everything else is identical every time you come through. This thing called the ladder means you do it different every single time. And that allows you to step through the body with different slices. So when you choose this thing, PEG, phase encode gradient, this picks out one slice of uh, the body in that direction. All right, then you move here and you turn off the phase encode gradient. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, try to go back, read, watch again, try to make it make some sense, write down a question and you can talk to me at our office hours. All right, so what you've done is apply the phase of code gradient. So they are all processing at the same frequency now, but they're out of phase with each other. That's why it's called the phase encode gradient.
Now, what do we have to do? Ooh, it's getting complicated. We have to go back and remember uh, lecture 25, right? What was happening there? Well, that was the, we're trying to do the spin echo sequence. So now we need to apply this pulse, which is your pi pulse, because you're wanting this echo to come in at time TE. So at time TE over two, you apply your pi pulse, just like before. So all this stuff had to come in between there. So this is at time t over 2, even though it's not labeled here, which means we're going to expect another echo coming at time t over 2 after that. Is that right? That has to be. The only trick to this is, is remember, you're beaming in that pi pulse into the body. Do you want all the proton spins to respond to that? No, you don't. You only want to talk to the one axial slice. So when this pi pulse comes, you've got to apply the slice selection gradient again. So there are some rules to pulse sequences. There's a couple of them. They're a little confusing, but they're pretty straightforward. One of our rules is that when you're beaming RF radiation into the body, pi by 2 pulse, pi pulse, the slice selection gradient has to be on. That's how you know you're only talking to that one particular slice. It's really important. So when this thing's on, that's on. When that's on, that's on. And then otherwise, it's off. Don't worry about this bit extending underneath the line. That's just a real subtlety of how the magnetic gradients are applied. I don't have time to get into it in this course. This is the right symbol, but if you were just to draw the gradient on there, uh, I would take that for sure. Uh, at some time later, if you have more interest and if you take medical imaging, you will for sure learn why some of it's underneath and some is above, but we just don't time to, have to get into it, particularly since we're not face to face. Okay, so that is one, two, three, four, five steps. Hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, oh, beautiful. Step six is turn off the slice selection gradient. That's an easy one, right? Because the slice selection gradient was on when the pi pulse was on. We step forward in time. Now it's off, all right? So the gradient's only on here and here. Phase encode gradient is only on here and here. Frequency encode gradient is only on here. Now we have located where in the body this signal is coming from, toe to head. We know where it's coming from, what row, back to front, but now we need to know left or right. We're going to need a third gradient. So now I'm looking down on the patient. Now we want to know left to right. Where is it coming from? And to do that, we're going to apply the frequency encode gradient. All right, so let's see how the frequency encode gradient works. I'll go back to the IMAO site. So that was selective excitation in the slice plane. We just saw phase encode gradient. What was the point of phase encode gradient? Apply a gradient, get them all spinning at different speeds such that they lose phase with each other, turn it off. Now I'm going to do frequency encode gradient. All right, it's the final step in spatial encoding, the frequency encode gradient. So in this case, it's going to be this horizontal signal coming in. It's going to modify the Lamar frequency in that direction throughout the time that it's applied. All right. So remember, they were all spinning at the same rate but out of phase with each other from front to back. But now from left to right, I am actually going to make them spin at different frequencies as I'm taking the measurement. That's what I want to do. So let's just see the animation of how that works. All right. So they're all spinning the same. Here comes your gradient. Right? Gradient is weak here, so these things will spin slower. Magnetic field is strong here. That's what the gradient means, more magnetic field. So they're going to spin faster over here. Different Lamar frequencies means different radio frequencies coming out of the body, which we can then measure from left to right. All right? So maybe we can watch that again. Let's see what happens. Okay, there it goes. Right, so that's what we were doing. Let's take a look at this. See how they're spinning fast over here, weak over here? This can be measured on our signal. All right, and that's the third step. So I'll go back to this graph. We're in step seven, the frequency encode gradient. What have we just been saying? Let's go through this one last time to review. Axial slice selection gradient selects one axial slice. You apply it, you only let the RF talk to that slice, turn it off, done. Now we want to know, say, top to bottom. You apply the phase encode gradient. You just get the spins. When you're done, they're all spinning at the Lamar precession frequency, but out of phase, front to back, that allows us to tell front to back. You turn it off. 
Then we want to know left to right. And to do that, we'll apply the frequency encode gradient, which is going to make the spins on one side of the body slow and the spins on the other side fast, which means that when the RF comes in, we will be able to measure that. The, the spin echo, which is here, comes in while the frequency encode gradient is on. And so you read out signal from the row you selected. And that was this animation I showed at the beginning. So this selects slice selection gradient, selects the axial slice, Phase encode gradient tells you which row of that slice you're talking to. Frequency encode gradient, FEG, reads out the entire row. So another one of our rules of pulse sequences is that when this RF pulse comes in, the frequency encode gradient has to be on. So when slice selection gradient is on is when you're beaming in RF radiation. When you're measuring signal from the patient, Frequency and grow, frequency encode gradient has to be on. These are our rules. So our rules are we're going from left to right. Whenever you're measuring RF signal, the frequency gradient better be on. Whenever you're beaming RF pi or pi by two pi or pi by two pulses into the patient, slice selection gradient has to be on. And phase encode gradient comes before this data is acquired. All right. That whole thing, these eight steps, is one measurement. You need to do many for one slice, like we showed. So in that 8x8 eight eight example in your multiple choice question, I would need eight of these patterns to get that whole slice. The only thing that changes between your eight measurements is you change the phase encode gradient. Each time, you use a slightly different phase encode gradient. And that just gives you a different y coordinate. So if they're not out of phase at all, meaning your phase encode gradient is essentially zero, you're in the middle of the body. If you have the stuff on the one side of the patient way ahead of the spins on the other, maybe you're on the top of the patient, you can reverse it and make the spins at the back of the patient way ahead of the other spins, and then that's how you know you're at the back. All right, so those nine steps. You go through, so my green arrow here is showing you go all the way back to the beginning and do it over, over and over and over and over and over. So, you know, a typical MR um, sequence in, in a patient nowadays uh, it's going to take about you know, 20, 25 minutes, something like that. Uh, and that's just multiple measurements over and over and over. All right. So how do we apply these gradients? Let's look at some of the hardware now. So this is a cutaway of an MR and an MR. Same picture, different things. Here's the patient lying inside. The main magnet in gray here is the magnet here in gold. This is a superconducting magnet. All right, that means that this is, it's a large coil of a special type of wire. It's bathed in liquid helium to keep it below the superconducting temperature. The liquid helium is surrounded by a huge door of liquid nitrogen, so it's expensive and it costs a lot to keep it kind of filled with those cryogenic fluids. Uh, but that applies that one and a half Tesla field down the direction of the body. That is on all the time. You then have gradient coils. So see these other coils here and here? These are the coils which are going to superimpose those changes onto the main field. So the field is always going like from toe to head, and you're just going to make it a little weaker down here, stronger down here, always pointing in that direction. Different on your left than your right, always pointing in that direction. That's really important. So this is that magnet immersed in liquid helium. Here are the gradient coils which surround the person. And then lastly, closest to the body are the radio frequency coils. These are the body coils, the pickup coils. These are what are listening into the patient. All right, so you've got main magnetic field, gradient coils, and radio frequency coils to listen. It actually looks like this. If you want to know what the design looks like, uh, because if you're trying to do like how to do right hand rule to have magnetic fields pointing in these directions, the gradient magnets look like this. The Z coils are easy. These are called Helmholtz coils. These are loops. But to make the fields be different at like the, the top and bottom of the patient or left and right of the patient, you need a weird kind of shape. And these are called saddle coils, right? They have these particular shapes. So this is all three of them combined. Here's a better image of just what the Z coils look like, the Y coils, and the X coils. So these are all saddle coils, so you can see what the geometry is. Uh, in practice, the Z is usually the axial, but whether the X or Y is phase encode or frequency encode gradient does not really matter. All right, They can actually be interchangeable in that direction. So that's not, that's not so important.
important to you. All right, so these are how these uh, fields are are being generated. Uh, so it is all a right-hand rule kind of thing. These are the loops that um, you know generate these uh, different different coils. So I'm getting a lot of this uh, material from this IMAO site. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do. I would just try to go through this site, just look through. These are some neat kind of uh, you know pictures to just give you an idea of how the slice encode gradient works. Um, just picking out a different slice of the body. You know, here's a video about how the phase encode gradient, you know, works. A little video about how the frequency encode gradient works as you're moving around. Um, it gets a little complicated. We're not going to talk about inverse space. So at a certain point, you have to maybe not be paying attention to this so much. Um, but uh, it can be very, very useful uh, for that. So with that, I think we're done. This is going back to this question. Hopefully now you would understand this multiple choice question a little better. Uh, there's a lot here. There's no doubt about it. Like I, I will continue to say, uh, MR is the hardest thing that we talk about in this class. There's no doubt. So what, are, what do I need you to learn about coming out of this unit? Gradients. Gradients, gradients, gradients. What are the three slices? How do you locate those three slices with the gradients. What are they? Slice selection gradient, phase encode gradient, frequency encode gradient. What do they do? Note that there's no math in any of this unit. Again, I know people, oh, I don't like uh, physics. I can't do physics because the math is hard. There's no math in this, but it's really understanding the physics of what's going on. It's tricky. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's easy. It's a little hard to understand. It might take some work. All right, but understanding how each of these gradients superimposed on the main field allow you to distinguish toe to head, left to right, top to bottom. And then very importantly, what order you do them all in. So I need you to know those gradients and I need you to know what a pulse sequence like this looks like. What is each row of a pulse sequence? What is it representing? How, what's happening as you move through time from time zero to time later? What are each row signify in terms of the gradient? And how do these things relate to each other? If I ask you to draw these things, you can't just randomly put them on the lines. You have, they all go in a particular place for a particular reason. All right, and that's really important. So if none of that makes sense, look through the lectures, do all the readings, do the IMAOS thing. Again, write down your questions. Let's try to talk in the future going forward so we can get those differences resolved. So I think that's all I have for now. So hopefully that made a little sense to you, and we will talk in the future. All right. Good luck, guys.